Your love is my salvation And my life is in your hands But you're with me in this valley And I'll see you move Hey, y'all, it's good to see you today. Thanks again for letting us come into, once again, your place of worship. Uh, we gathered here, you, you, you've worshiped and singing already, and now we're going to dive into the Word. Before we do that, let me once again remind you about giving. Uh, when we are generous people, that's when we are most like the God we serve. Our God is a generous and giving God, and we want to be a generous and giving people. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, so I'm not asking you to do something out of, um, out of uh, necessity or, or begrudgingly. I'm asking you to cheerfully act like the God who saved you and who gave you everything you have. So again, uh, tithing is not a matter of payment for services rendered. Tithing is part of our worship. So you be sure and worship and giving however you happen to do that in the setting you're in. So now we're, we're talking about above the noise, which means we're talking about grace. That's what we're, that's what we're going to deal with for this, in, in this series. And as we talk about grace, we, we spoke last week about the fact that grace is one of those things where it, be, it existed before the very foundations of the world were made. And Jesus then comes and displays it. He becomes God incarnate, God in the flesh. But he, he, in, in doing that, he becomes grace in person, grace in a person, grace in the flesh. He shows us what grace is all about. That grace then allows us to continue to move forward and it allows us to be different, to be new, to be changed. And so in that, Jesus is constantly working in and through us. Let me show you a story. <clears throat> it's in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and I'm going to read verses 13 to 17. And as I read this, you need to understand that Jesus is just beginning his public ministry. Uh, Jesus' public ministry only spans about three years. He's a carpenter for most of his life. He then becomes a rabbi. He begins to teach. But his public ministry, where everybody picks up on what's going on, is only about three years old, and we're right at the beginning of that. Also remember, as we jump into the story, that John the Baptist, who is a, a key player in this story, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, and so, uh, and so they're related, and they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, they've known each other from birth. Literally, there's a story of, of Mary coming up, to, uh, coming up to John's mother, and when Mary speaks, John's, the, John's mother feels John leap in her womb. So, so there's been a connection between these two from before birth. And so now John has become, uh, uh, this is something I think most people don't get, John the Baptist has become the preeminent religious teacher and leader of his day. Jesus has not started his ministry yet, and everybody's listening to John. The king is listening to John. So John's got everybody's attention. He is the religious superstar of his day. Everybody's coming out to hear him. And so John is out preaching and baptizing people. Baptizing is an, is an ancient Jewish form of a cleansing ritual where, where, where you go down to the water, you come back up, and, and you, are, you are ceremonially clean. You are washed away. Your sins are washed away, and you come away clean. The idea is the same as any other washing. You wash away the impurities. You wash away. So this is the imagery that John is using, and, and Jesus then approaches him, Matthew chapter 3, Verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? You, 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 you see this, this proper attitude, this proper sense of place inside of John, where John realizes that Jesus, he can't take authority over Jesus. He's like, I'm, I'm going to baptize you? 
And, and Je- but, but watch, at this, Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. You see, Jesus needed to be baptized because Jesus is 100% human. He's also 100% God. So John, not probably able to articulate Jesus as 100% God, still understands that there's something different. There's something special. There's something more about Jesus. And so he's like, I'm not going to baptize you. You baptize me. It's kind of the same thing that happens with Peter. Peter, when Jesus wants to wash Peter's feet, and Peter says, you're going to wash. No, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm supposed to wash yours. And Jesus says, you need to let this happen. Same thing here. John says, I'm not going to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus says, you need to let this happen because this is how we'll fulfill all righteousness. So it says, then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. So he goes under the water. He comes out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Y'all, this is, this is such a profound theological moment because this is the moment where you have the son, Jesus, being baptized, coming out of the water. The Holy Spirit comes down and rests on him. And then the Father, God the Father, speaks from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You, you, you have the entire Trinity in one place at one time. All three persons of the Trinity. This is why the Trinity is so hard for people to explain. Because a lot of people want to say, well, you know, it's like, it's like water. Sometimes it's a solid, sometimes it's a liquid, sometimes it's a gas. Okay, that's fine, but water cannot be the solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time. In this moment, you've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all there at one time. Those who would say that, 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 that there is no Trinity, it's just God, God as Father is the one way He's in charge. God as the Son is where He's forgiving us. God as the Holy Spirit is where He's empowering us. Those who would say that, they fall into a trap called modalism. Uh, that means you see God in certain modes at certain times and he looks different because the modes you see him in. But this passage right here, all three persons of the Trinity are present in one place. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all there, all separate, yet still one. I know, I know, it's an awful lot for us to deal with, and it, and it doesn't make good sense in our understanding of the way the world works. But when I, I just believe when we wake up on the other side and we actually see it from God's perspective, it will go, oh, oh, well, that makes sense. So grace comes first. Even in Jesus' ministry, it starts with a baptism. I want to, I want to show you three things about grace showing up in your life. Again, let me read verses 13 and 14. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John, but John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. The first thing I want you to know about grace is this, and it's good news. Jesus approaches you. You see, every other religion, every other religious system of thought on the planet, you're constantly chasing the gods. You're, you're, you're trying to get their attention. If you're, if, you're, if, you're in a, if you're in a polytheistic sense where there are many gods, and this would be the ancient Greek gods, the ancient Roman gods, uh, this would be Hinduism or Buddhism, you're constantly trying to get the gods' attention. And many religions, many ancient religions work this way, where what you're trying to do is you're trying to get God's attention so he'll notice you, so he'll bless you, so he or she will like you or, 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 or help you or heal you or, or bless your crops or, 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 or fertilize your land, whatever it may be. You're trying to get God's attention so that that God can bless you somehow. Or at the very least, you're trying to get God's attention so that that God won't be angry with you. This is, the, you know, you're sacrificing to that God. You're, you're not sacrificing for your sins. You're sacrificing to calm the God down. You're sacrificing to make the God feel better. 
And, and, and these gods out there, your humans are constantly striving and reaching to get to them. Jesus is not like that. Jesus, the God of the Bible, does not require us to chase him first. He chases us first. Now, don't get me wrong. After he pursues us and we receive him, we then need to pursue him so that we can know him better, so that we can be more like him. So I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to make this one-sided. This should not be one-sided either way. If you look at these other religions, it's one-sided where humans are chasing the gods and the gods don't care a thing about them. You look at, you look at Christianity, Christianity cannot become that God chases us and we don't care anything about him. It can't be like that. No, no, no. We pursue God because God first pursued us. Let me say it another way. We love because he first loved us. We know how to love because we saw it lived out in Jesus. God loved us first. He pursues us. You know, quite often what the enemy of our souls will do is convince us that we're so bad that not even God wants anything to do with us. That's just never true. God is pursuing us at all times. He is pursuing you. You just need to recognize that he's there and surrender to his presence. Stop trying to do it your way, John the Baptist, and insist that, no, 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 you need to, no, no, you need to do this or you need to do, no, no, no. Do what God asked you to because he's the one that pursued you. He's the one that came after you. And when Jesus approaches us first, that's how we know that he loves us and the moment is right. I want you to look at the next one. Jesus replies to John the Baptist, let it be so now. Go ahead and baptize me, he's saying. It is proper for us to do this, watch, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus approaches me first. So grace is coming to you. Grace is coming for you. Grace is coming at you. Jesus is coming at us, not in a negative sense, but he's headed toward us. He approaches us first. But Jesus, once we receive him, watch, once we surrender to what he has for us, watch, once John surrenders to what Jesus tells him, this is appropriate, let's do this. Once John surrenders to that, once John surrenders to that, Jesus fulfills you. He, he approaches you. He comes to you. He comes to you first. But once you surrender to him, he will fulfill you. In other words, watch. He will bring you to your greatest point of fulfillment, your greatest point of joy, your greatest point of peace, your greatest point of productivity, your greatest point of Jesus will fulfill you. In this particular case, by the way, Jesus literally fulfills John's life here because John's whole purpose in ministry is to point forward to Jesus. John's saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then when Jesus shows up, John says, there he is, right there, that's him. I told you he was coming, now he's here, see him, he's right there. Now what, what, what's got to happen, watch, I, I told you. John's ministry is the most powerful ministry of the day. And so God has raised him up so that when Jesus arrives and is baptized, watch, everybody's watching. Every news organization in, the, in, 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 in Jerusalem was there. All the TV programs, all of the, you understand, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching this. But, but, but they were all there. Everybody was watching when John baptized Jesus and it fulfills John's life it fulfills John's ministry and it fulfills the people around who see that okay if Jesus needs to be baptized then I do too and all of us all the way to the point that now if you're a believer and you've been a believer very long you've been baptized and if you haven't been baptized you come see us we'll take care of that the truth is he fulfills you y'all we're not going to find, how many times, how many, how many different movies, how many times do I need to say it, how many times does Hollywood need to say it, 
You're not going to find fulfillment in the things of this world. Wealth is not going to do it. Fame is not going to do it. Power is not going to do it. All of these things are not going to do it. You find fulfillment in Christ. When Jesus, who approaches you first, when Jesus shows up, he brings with him the fulfillment of the promise God has always had on your life. He fulfills us. Now watch. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. Now watch. It's Jesus coming out of the water. It's Jesus. This is, this is Jesus' moment. He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven, this is my Son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. So everything centers on Jesus in this moment. Watch, watch. Jesus approaches you. He came first, okay? He came after you. He chased you. We know how to love because we saw God love us. Jesus fulfills you. But then Jesus must become your focus. Jesus becomes our focus. Listen to me. You focused on everything else you can think of. And it's not working. Try Jesus. In, in John's life, this, this happens very dramatically. John, again, again, John is the preeminent religious leader of, of the moment. He, he, everybody's coming to hear him. Then Jesus starts his ministry. And as Jesus starts his ministry, people start listening to Jesus. The focus shifts from John to Jesus. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem fair, but that's precisely the way it was set up. Even John says, I must become less so that he can become more. I must watch. John's here. Jesus arrives on the scene. Quite frankly, as a religious leader, he's just a beginner. But then Jesus raises up. As Jesus raises up, John fades. John won't survive even to the cross. The, the, the king will have him executed. John won't survive to the cross. But John has called out that the, that, that, that the Holy One is coming, the Messiah is coming. Jesus now arrives on the scene and John from this moment, from this moment right here where John baptizes Jesus, it starts to shift. You say, well, I, I, I don't know if I want it to be that way. Listen to me. Jesus' presence in your life will make your life better if you are willing to fade away while he rises up. You see, we've got to let him become our focus. Again, we focused on everything else. We focused on the money. We focused on the things. We focused on the possessions. We focused on the house. We focused on the, on the, on the promotions. We focused on the power. We, foc we focused on all that. But if we let Jesus become our focus, he will do in us what we were never able to do on our own. He's got to be the focus. John couldn't save everyone. John could not be the perfect sacrifice for every human being. John could not be the Messiah. He could only point to the Messiah. And then when he came, he could only begin to shift his focus to the Messiah. He must become greater and I must become less. The, it, John, John understands this. We need to understand this too. Once Jesus, watch, once he brings light into our lives, once he brings hope into our lives, once he brings promise into our lives, once he approaches us and said, hey, I, I had a job for you, once he fulfills our lives and puts us in the place where we find the greatest fulfillment, once all of that happens, our focus must turn to him. And it must stay there. If our focus goes back to ourselves, then we try to put ourselves back up and elevate ourselves back up. And by doing so, we try to lower him. And that's always going to be a loser in our lives. He gave you grace. He gave you peace. He gave you fulfillment. Elevate him. Focus on him. See Christ every day in every way. And when you do that, he will set you free one day at a time. Pray with me. Father God, 
we are not unlike John the Baptist. We have our own agenda. We have our own things we're trying to do. But Lord, while we do that, let us do that with a clear focus on you. So that, I mean, you've approached us. You're fulfilling us. Let us declare you in the midst of all of it. Lord, whatever distracts us, help us to set it aside. Whatever takes us away from you, help us to let it go. And Father God, as all of that happens, help us to follow you with every part of who we are. Let us become less so that you become greater in our lives, in our church, in our community, and in our world. And we will give you praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen.